once I got to the area where that steep gully is, it just accelerated. A survivor of that deadly avalanche at a California ski resort describes the terrifying experience as that same resort gets hit with another crush of snow. Today, another avalanche hit Palisades Tahoe, the second in two days. Good evening. Welcome to West Coast Wrap. I'm Alex Savage. New storms moving in tonight, dropping snow flurries in Seattle, sending temperatures plunging below zero in Montana and Oregon and causing problems on the roads. We begin our storm coverage in the Sierra where that second avalanche happened today. A live look at conditions in Olympic Valley near where the st snow started to slide today. No one was hurt, but the ski patrol did shut down that area for inspection. After crews cleared the area, it reopened. Today's avalanche comes on the heels of yesterday's tragedy at the resort. One person killed, another injured in a separate avalanche. One of the survivors spoke today about the decisions he had to make. It flipped me onto my belly, and now I'm going down head first, trying to just swim uh, to the top. I was kind of looking up and trying to, you know, make sure my head's above when it does stop because it just kind of cements you in. And, um, and then I just got hit from the rest of the debris field or, you know, that came down, and it just buried me so quick. And all I could think about it, and I've taken an Abbey class, was maybe punch a hole with my right arm that wasn't sealed yet in, and make an air pocket. And then it just, like I said, got real quiet. Nothing's happening. I yell every once in a while, help. But at that point, I felt this probe hit the middle of my back or right in my spine, and it just jarred me. And I was like, oh, man. And that's when I could hear the person above me just go, I found him or we got him. Several lifts that take skiers to steep terrain at the resort were closed today. People heading to ski resorts in the Sierra are being warned about dangerous driving conditions. Images on social media show a big rig that started sliding on Interstate 80 in Truckee today. CHP officers say the truck's brake lines froze here. Thankfully, no one was injured. Montana is experiencing extreme cold. With the wind chill factored in, temperatures feel like they're 35 degrees below zero. The northwest corner of Montana is seeing a combination of strong wind gusts and snow limiting visibility. Bitter cold conditions are expected throughout the night there. People in the Pacific Northwest are bracing for some of the coldest temperatures they've seen in more than a decade. There were some snow flurries in Seattle late this afternoon and more snow is likely. Heavy snow falling in eastern Washington tonight. In Spokane, transportation workers spent the day clearing roads. In Snoqualmie Pass, 18 inches of snow is expected with these storms. And these storms have prompted schools to close across Oregon tomorrow. These are live pictures tonight from Mount Hood, where some ski resorts have received more than three feet of snow over the past 48 hours, and there is more on the way. Some Portland area schools sent kids home early today because of the plummeting temperatures. Let's bring in KTVU meteorologist Mark Tamayo. And Mark, this kind of extreme cold is rare for the Pacific Northwest. Very rare, Alex. We could be talking about decades eventually, maybe when this is all said and done, down back to like maybe 1990 or so with how cold this pattern is. So snowfall, low elevation snowfall, the order of one to three inches. Winds up there around 40 to 50 miles an hour. And you've been talking about the wind chills uh, well below zero, possibly down up below maybe 20 below zero when you factor in the wind. Now here's a look at the overall weather pattern. In the big picture, as you can see, that very cold air mass moving in from the north, and we have the, the showers that have been developing throughout the day and cold enough that we are talking about low elevation snowfall. Here's a look at some of the snow reports up in Washington earlier today. And this one site uh, had it uh, prepped here. This is near Leavenworth reporting uh, three and a half inches of uh, snowfall in just two hours. So it gives you an idea of the uh, snowfall rates that have been uh, developing throughout the afternoon hours. And here is a look at the radar coverage. We're showing you the greens, showing you the uh, the rain showers and also the the, the whites indicating the, the snow showers throughout the afternoon hours throughout the day in fact and into the afternoon here's a closer look at seattle i did see some uh, some uh, snowfall reports earlier this afternoon so it's kind of linking up with the radar coverage right now in seattle it is 30 degrees right now in portland it is 42
32 and temperatures, especially in Portland, will continue to drop off. Take a look at the Portland forecast as we head into Saturday, a forecast high of only 19 degrees, bitterly cold air moving into the region. And you can see into Friday, the snow showers kind of uh, decreasing in coverage up in Washington. But look what happens in Oregon. And we could be talking about some snowfall developing closer to uh, Portland. And eventually we could talk maybe about one to three inches before all is said and done as we head into the weekend. But the cold, the bitterly cold air mass will remain in place right on into the weekend. Alex. All right, dangerously cold yeah. conditions in the Pacific Northwest. Mark, thank you. Homeless advocates in Denver are worried that migrants living in encampments are not prepared for a sharp drop in temperatures that's expected over the next couple of days. Fox 31's Vicente Arenas shows us how migrants are being taught survival skills for weather conditions they might not be accustomed to. This smattering of tents at this encampment near 51st and Emerson taking a beating today. As winds began gusting and with more wickedly cold weather headed to Denver, people here have been taught how to survive sub-zero temperatures. The tents are all separated from each other. That's intentional, right? It is intentional because we're designing the camp in a way that to reduce the fire risk. Advocate Amy Beck says volunteers have been doing their best to keep migrants indoors or get them tickets to other cities. But if those migrants have nowhere else to go, this camp is designed to help protect them from the cold. We have all the supplies to stay warm, hand warmers and so on, and every, uh, every tent has heat, a small safe heater that they can use that keeps them warm at night. This encampment is the latest to pop up after hundreds of migrants were forced to leave their tents from an encampment at Zunai and Spear. There is a food storage tent as well as a supply tent and a warming tent is also going up. They're most concerned about the cold, you know, the cold because they, they think that, uh, how to explain to you, like they think that this is going to be dangerous. The camp is intentionally in a remote location not far from the livestock showgrounds, but is difficult to see. The city says dealing with the migrant crisis is costing $3 million a week, $180 million a year, and there are no additional shelters opening, which is why advocates say it's better to have a tent than nothing at all. Advocates tell us they'll be checking on the migrants as the weather just gets colder and colder. They fear, though, that there will be a lot more migrants coming once the severe weather shelter shut down in the city. But just how many come this way is not clear. In North Denver, Vicente Arenas, Fox 31. Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo says he is waiting to see how storms played out today before deciding whether to reopen some state offices. Today, the governor shut down most state offices in the northwest part of Nevada, including Reno, as a safety precaution with near whiteout conditions overnight. He's urging anyone driving in this area to stay up to date with alerts coming from transportation and public safety officials. One truck rolled over during snowy conditions in Las Vegas today. Paramedics took the driver of this truck to the hospital out of an abundance of caution. He was the only person inside that truck. No other vehicles were involved in that crash. Now we turn to Arizona, where Phoenix police shot and killed a man who allegedly pointed a gun at officers today. Officers were called to a home near Van Buren and 32nd Street just after 11 o'clock this morning for a welfare check. They say they spoke with a man at the back door of that home, and after a quick interaction, police say the man pulled out a gun and pointed it at the two officers. Police believe the man fired at least one round, but it's unclear who shot first. This isn't a shooting call. This isn't a fight call where there's kind of a violent interaction going on beforehand. Um, this is kind of a check welfare where we're coming out to make sure the people inside this residence are okay. Um, these officers didn't necessarily uh, um, expect a violent encounter. None of the officers involved were hurt. Both officers did have their body cameras activated and police expect that video to be released within 14 days, which is department policy. A trip to the mailbox almost turned tragic for a man in central California. We'll have a story behind this terrifying close call coming up. Also, an electric vehicle catches fire inside a home's garage in Colorado. The special tool that crews use to put out the flames here.
Some scary moments caught on camera in Fresno, California. A security camera captured a man dodging an out of control car. He was checking his mail on Tuesday when that car collided with another vehicle nearby. The car then started spinning out of control and slammed right into his mailbox. He jumped out of the way to avoid being hit. The man says it felt like a near death experience. It's still unclear tonight what happened to the drivers of the two other cars involved in that crash. We turned out to Colorado where an electric vehicle caught fire as it was charging inside a home's garage. That vehicle is a Jaguar I-Pace. Reporter Kim Posey shows us the new tool that firefighters are using to help put out EV related fires. Most of the fire damage is here in the garage and it is boarded up, but there is smoke damage throughout the home. Video from South Metro Fire Rescue shows smoke coming from the home on Mobile Street in Centennial. David Frosch and his wife heard the smoke alarm and got out unharmed. Their 2019 Jaguar I-Pace EV caught fire while charging and the battery pack continued to smolder. So crews pulled the vehicle out of the garage and covered it with a new 62-pound electric vehicle blanket to limit the oxygen. Then the vehicle was towed to a safer area. Their message? We don't want people to necessarily feel afraid of those. We just want them to better understand that there is a risk of fire. Last year, Jaguar recalled some of the I-PACE vehicles from 2019 to 2024 model years due to the risk of high voltage batteries catching fire. Firefighters say it is very important to stay up to date on all vehicle recalls. It's also important to follow manufacturer instructions and only use approved charging devices. Kim Posey, Fox 31. Tonight, the FAA is investigating the production of Boeing 737 MAX 9 models after that door plug blew off an Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight. Officials say they're looking into the manufacturing of those door plugs, specifically the type they believe came off in the middle of the flight. The FAA says its investigation is focusing on whether Boeing failed to ensure its products were in compliance with FAA regulations. Boeing says it will be cooperating with the investigation. Turning back now to those new storms hitting the west tonight. They're coming with a mix of snow and rain in Arizona. The snow plows were out this morning in Flagstaff. You can see the streets covered in snow. Around the same time, storm clouds were moving into the Phoenix area, bringing rain. Let's get back now to KTVU meteorologist Mark Tamayo, who is tracking these storms and Mark the falling temperatures. Yeah, big drop off in uh, temperatures, Alex. Here's the national perspective. As you can see, some areas well below zero. Look at the right now, Bismarck. You can see 25 uh, below as we head into your Thursday night. And we're showing you some more temperatures across portions of the west, and they are really dipping down as you can see with the, with those uh, with the uh, drop off in the numbers. So right now the the satellite and the radar as you can see the main action is has been focused up in the Pacific Northwest once again up towards Seattle and into uh, Portland uh, showing you this right now the current snowfall coverage and it looks like the main activity begins to shift to the south moving into Oregon for tomorrow. So Seattle of course they had increasing clouds and some snow showers this afternoon a temperature a high of 45 degrees but temperatures are dropping off rapidly in San Francisco with the storm clouds cleared out compared to yesterday and lots of sunshine today temperatures in the mid 50s and down in Southern California lots of uh, clear skies temperatures in in the 60s compared with that to the the temperatures up north at 64 looks very nice. Here's a look at the overall weather story 20s and 30s up in the north for tomorrow the, the rain the snow kind of moves to the south closer to Oregon for tomorrow. Some increasing cloud cover for San Francisco. Lots of sunshine for Southern California and then cloudy skies out toward Denver with temperatures in the 30s. So here is the forecast model as you can see. We'll take this into your Friday afternoon. Notice it's dry in Southern California. It's dry in Arizona even for a good portion of California. But the snow showers moving to the south moving into uh, moving into Oregon. So Portland could uh, be uh, talking about the, the snowfall. In fact, here's that next system that wants to come on board. This will be into Saturday. So this is another possibly stronger system for Northern California. And this will eventually be a snow producer. You can see that tight circulation here approaching the coastline of uh, Southern Oregon. So that'll be a big factor in the forecast as you can see uh, over the next uh, several days. So for Seattle tomorrow,
the very cold air continues to uh, settle in, as you can see, into the weekend, possibly some uh, some snow showers. But for the most part, we're talking about some uh, some bitterly cold temperatures into the weekend and into early next week. For San Francisco, we're going to thicken up the cloud cover on Friday. It looks like that rain cloud on Saturday and the rain could be heavy at times for Northern California and the Bay Area. As you can pick out closer to uh, Southern California, the dry weather stretch, as you can see, wants to settle in over the next uh, few days. And the same story for Phoenix. But uh, that bitterly cold air will continue to top the weather headlines up in the Pacific Northwest, even into the weekend and possibly into early next week. Something that definitely bears watching. Yeah, the cold sticking around for a while. Yeah. Mark, thank you. Well, it's not just rain, snow and those chilly temperatures. These systems moving into the west are also bringing some strong winds. Fox 11's Christina Gonzalez shows us how those gusts are causing problems all across Southern California. Last night, four in the morning, windy, lands over the vehicle. A large jacaranda tree in Long Beach. I could have been parking the car myself with the children in the car getting in or out, but it happened at four in the morning, everyone's in bed, thank God. The wind and cold an issue for big and yes, even small trees, especially near the foothills. Alex Silver is raking away the mulch from under tropical trees at Granada Hills Papaya Tree Nursery, where you'd think the papayas and other fruit would be destroyed by recent frost. But they're not. He goes against the common belief that more mulch will help protect your citrus or your bananas, at least in Southern California. What you want to do is remove the layer of mulch temporarily, mind you, and that allows the Earth's heat to escape and warm the canopy. And you can get uh, two, perhaps three degrees, which may seem trivial, but it's a big deal, actually. A matter of degrees, pun intended here. The canopy of trees helps keep the Earth's heat during cold snaps, especially if the ground is wet. Water is a very efficient uh, heat sink, if you will. It, it holds heat. You get uh, your common five-gallon buckets, pails, if you will, and fill them up with water. A real simple thing. Why citrus growers water their crops during freeze warnings? Do the same with your plants, especially if they're in pots, which you can move under your eaves. They act like tree canopies. So does fabric attached to simple frames that you've probably seen in many a Southland backyard. Finally, here's a good excuse to not put away the old incandescent Christmas lights just yet. Take those Christmas tree lights off and wrap it around the tree you're trying to protect. Keep in mind that you don't want the, the, the new LED lights that are efficient because they don't give off heat. It works out well, but the other two methods, removing the mulch and having a well, wet ground or surface soil, pails of water that that will pretty much help you out for the most part. And that was Fox 11's Christina Gonzalez reporting for us tonight. Farmers say in the next few months the weather could have a big impact on strawberry production in California. Almost 90 percent of all strawberries grown here in the U.S. come from California. Some large strawberry growers plant their crops as early as October, which means many of the plants are in the ground. But this recent cold weather is bad for the valuable crop. Right now, the weather is bad because it is very cold. The rain is affecting us a little, and now it is starting to freeze. During winter, strawberries are shipped from mainly Southern California, and as the weather warms up, production moves north. And they just looked at me like, like confused as much as I was. Like, right here it says you are dead. His family thought he was dead for months. They were even given an urn full of his ashes. Coming up tonight, a medical examiner explains what caused this mix-up. Also, CES 2024 in Las Vegas introduces the world to a new pet center. Tonight, how a new robot can help to take care of your cats or dogs. A new government report shows inflation is on the rise once again after cooling off for most of last year. The Department of Labor says the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, increased by 0.3% between November and December. That pushes the annual inflation rate to 3.4%. That is slightly higher than what a Dow Jones survey of economists hoped for. In comparison, the annual Consumer Price Index increase in 2022 was 6.4%. 
Stocks were mixed today on that inflation report. The Dow bounced back and ended slightly in positive territory after losing more than 200 points early on in the session. The Nasdaq was flat and the S&P was down a little more than three points after swinging up and down throughout the day. Many traders are hoping the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates significantly this year. A single wallet has changed the way one Oregon medical examiner processes its death certificates. Fox 12's Adrian Thomas shares the story of false identification. Family of Tyler Chase say on September 11th, the Multnomah County medical examiner contacted them saying Chase had died of a drug overdose. Multnomah County admits it wasn't until December 18th they realized an error had been made and contacted Chase and his family the next day. 23-year-old Tyler Chase has been living in a recovery program for the last several months after struggling on the streets with substance abuse and not having contact with his family for several years. In an interview with Fox 12 Investigates, Chase says he learned of the issue when his food assistance benefits weren't active after he was approved for them in October. I go to DHS and uh, ask me to enter my social security and everything. I'm like, all right, let's see if we can help you fix this. And then all of a sudden they started interrogating me. Like, oh, can we see your ID and all this? And I'm like, why do you need my ID and everything? So I give it to them. And then they just looked at me like, like confused as much as I was. They're like, right here it says you are dead. It was a shock to Chase, who still hadn't been able to track down his family. What Chase didn't know is that his family had received a formal death certificate and this urn full of ashes that were actually a stranger's. Chase tells us on December 19th, officials from Multnomah County's medical examiner's office found him at the recovery center where he's living and admitted to the mistake they made in wrongfully declaring him dead. Chase tells us county officials informed him the man that was found dead in Portland had been carrying Chase's wallet that was believed to have been stolen from Chase at the recovery center. So they find a paper ID of me that's smudged and everything and like, they're like, okay, well, this is Tyler John Chase. So they put them, put him down as me. And uh, I guess uh, then they notified the family, like, protocol. Chase and his family shared this screenshot from a FaceTime call with officials from the Multnomah County Medical Examiner's Office, showing him alive and well. The Medical Examiner's Office sent a statement to Fox 12 Investigates admitting their mistake and promising a change in policy. It reads in part, quote, We deeply regret that the misidentification happened. The misidentification occurred because the deceased person was carrying Mr. Tyler Chase's wallet and his official temporary Oregon driver's license. The medical examiner's office also launched a comprehensive review to identify any gaps in current practices and is working to implement an institutional change. Going forward, all individuals who are found with a temporary state-issued identification must also have fingerprints submitted for positive identification to ensure that this will never happen again. Adrian Thomas, Fox 12, Oregon. Hundreds of Google employees are being laid off. Most of those employees losing their jobs are in the voice assistant unit, as well as employees working on hardware for the Pixel, Nest, and Fitbit. Most of the augmented reality team is also being let go as well. The two founders of Fitbit are also reportedly leaving the company. Google acquired Fitbit back in 2021. The company announced last year it would be cutting around 12,000 jobs in order to try to cut costs. Well, the latest in emerging technology is on display in Las Vegas at CES, previously called the Consumer Electronics Show. The focus has been on in artificial intelligence and robots like this one. Company Augment Robotics is showing off what they call their family robot, which is capable of caring for pets. And that does it for West Coast Wrap tonight. We appreciate you watching. Have a great night.